Since the study of the biology of aquarium fish began, interest has focused increasingly on reproduction. In reproductive biology, we encounter a diversity of forms and processes. A few species even belong to the group of so-called pseudo-mammals. Their method of caring for their offspring leads us to conjecture that they've reached a special stage of development. They allow us to make remarkable observations regarding the care and feeding of the swimming larvae. The discus fish of the genus Symphizodon, native to South America, is widespread as an aquarium fish. In many ways, the breeding of this fish is especially interesting. Therefore, it's studied often. As the first discus fish were introduced in the 1920s, it was still believed this fish was uncomplicated in its reproductive biology. Similar to the angle fish, it soon could be bred without difficulty. However, only in the beginning of the 1930s was it first bred successfully in the United States. It became evident the discus was a special fish, possibly shrouded in many mysteries. Complicated and lengthy import routes allowed only few of these fish to be imported. But true discus fever, which is still in progress to this day, first broke out approximately 20 years later. In the 50s, imports became more frequent. Breeding the fish successfully in captivity allowed for more and more insight into the interesting reproductive biology of the discus fish. Meanwhile, many aquarists in Europe made a name for themselves with their study of the care and breeding of these fish. One of the 50s pioneers was Dr. Eduard schmidt Folke, who was not only able to report successful breeds, but also made discus history, particularly in the 1960s, with breeds still being cared for and bred today. Many of the secrets of keeping and breeding the discus were revealed during that time. But even today, there are still many mysteries about these fish. The discus is still one of the special fish in the field of aquaristics in respect to its care and reproduction. But why? Specimens caught in the wild and those bred in captivity have to be differentiated. Experienced discus keepers distinguish between them by the growth and the form of their tail fins, for example. Fish bred in captivity display a straightly grown tail fin with clean contours, while the fin rays of the fish caught in the wild are not so exactly and straightly grown. The care of both types is comparatively unproblematic when certain rules are observed. It's important that the fish are kept in roomy aquariums with a minimum height of 40 centimeters and a capacity of at least 200 liters. The water values are generally of secondary importance when a few important rules are followed. The pH value, that is the hydrogen ion concentration, should, when at all possible, lie between 6.0 and 7.0. And the level of nitrogen, the nitrite and nitrate values, should be kept as low as possible. This means that a very good water quality is an essential requirement for optimal care of the fish. To meet this requirement, a filter, as well as regular partial water changes, are important. Large amounts of fresh water do not appear to be of such great importance. It's essential fish are kept in healthy, bacteriologically well-cleansed aquarium water with small amounts of fresh water frequently added. Temperature of the water should be kept at approximately 29 degrees Celsius and may briefly fluctuate two or three degrees. When discus are put together with other fish, if at all, it's important the others have similar care requirements and are peaceable and healthy. Several species of fish carry pathogenic agents they're immune to themselves but are harmful to the discus. A further decisive point is a diet which is as varied as possible. All types of food imaginable should be offered to the discus, whereby high quality frozen food should only be given after being defrosted and rinsed thoroughly when at all possible. But be careful. 
Discus fish have difficulties with large pieces of food. When possible, the fish should be fed smaller quantities of food three or four times a day. Aside from that, the place where the aquarium stands should be quiet. Stress and confusion are poison for discus fish. When these points are followed, discus fish will be contented and will reward their keeper with vivacity and beauty. On the other hand, flaws in care will become visible immediately. No other aquarium fish will show you so quickly and unmistakably that it's not getting the proper care. And breeding, in this case, there are quite considerable differences between fish caught in the wild and those bred in captivity. While the various types of discus caught in the wild generally only breed under certain conditions equivalent to their native habitats, fish bred in captivity are much more tolerant regarding the conditions necessary for reproduction. More than 90% of the discus fish cared for today worldwide have been bred in captivity. This shows how much progress has been made in the study of reproductive biology. In the 50s and 60s, above all, the USA and Germany held the lead in discus breeding. But today, the focus has clearly shifted. Breeders in Asia, in particular, have shown often they also have the right touch. Today, you can say that a majority of all discus fish are bred in Asia. Not surprisingly, considering the imagination of the Asian peoples, some have interesting and unusual color variations. And the quality of these fish is always improving. This is a reason discus fish from Asia are known and sought after worldwide. And European breeders, for the most part, they concentrate on retaining the old standards. They care for and breed the wild color variations. Many new color varieties caught in the wild are studied by breeders and provide new data. The interest in keeping and breeding this special fish prompted discus lovers to organize into a breeder's association, initiated by Manfred Fahl. The basic idea for establishing the Discus Breeders Association was to tear apart the existing prejudices about caring for and keeping discus fish. For this purpose, the Discus Breeders Association was established on April 19, 1986. At the first meeting, 18 breeders were present. In the meantime, the number of participants has grown to over 120. Not only German breeders participate, but also breeders from many neighboring European countries. This Breeders Association holds regular meetings every spring and fall to provide the chance to exchange ideas and experiences. At these meetings, the problems connected with keeping and breeding the discus fish are discussed. In order to expose the discus to a larger public, we also try to hold discus exhibitions at regular intervals. The connecting link of the Breeders' Association is a newsletter with information about all facets of discus fish keeping. Pamphlets also give advice for optimal care and breeding. But also other sources appear at regular intervals providing a variety of information about the discus fish, which is often called the king of the Amazon. Even though the care of these fish in the appropriate aquariums is no longer difficult, breeding is still sometimes problematic. It's true that many discus breeders are sometimes driven nearly to the verge of despair. But why? Here as well, you have to differentiate between animals caught in the wild and those bred in captivity. 
Fish caught in the wild are sensitive to many things, such as condition of the water, size of tank, choice of sexual partner, food, light, decorational materials, and last but not least, the seasons. By contrast, many fish bred in captivity, often for generations, are much more tolerant and reproduce with much less difficulty. But often other difficulties arise which are seldom problems with fish caught in the wild. The fundamental question arises, is the breeding of the discus fish more difficult than breeding other species of aquarium fish? This must be answered with a definite no. But why? Aside from the tank and the breeding fish, the most important factor for breeding the discus successfully is without question, the water. Aside from the fact that the water should be low in minerals, it should also be lightly acidic, which means that depending on the species or breeding form, the pH value should range between 5.5 and 6.2. Often lightly sinking conductivity and pH values act as a trigger, or rather stimulate the willingness of the fish to spawn. Another important requirement for the healthy development of the eggs is healthy, bacteriologically well-conditioned water that is not all too fresh. It must be low on germs and maintained with an adequately sized and conditioned filter. The normal development of the eggs can only occur when the females, due to good care and a varied diet, are healthy and able to lay healthy eggs, which are then fertilized by the healthy sperm of the males. Especially when the fish spawn at too short intervals, the eggs will often die off after only a few hours. Despite prior fertilization, the eggs dissolve and later flow out of the egg membrane. This is why spawning at short intervals should be avoided. A period of about four weeks is advisable. This usually guarantees a healthy spawn that will develop well. Dying eggs, which have not yet been infected by fungus, will look like white eggs after a short time. They should not be mistaken for curdled or rather coagulated eggs, which are already dead when laid by the female and therefore white. These coagulated eggs do not harm the remaining healthy eggs with fungus infection as is often suspected. Their outer embryonic sac is smooth. Compared to the eggs infected with fungus, they show no trace of fungus mycelium. Fungal infection of the dead eggs usually first begins after a period of 48 to 55 hours. If bad quality water, rich in bacteria, does not accelerate this process. There are several reasons for the death of healthy fertilized eggs. Aside from the inviolable condition of the eggs that were laid, the composition of the water plays an important role. If the water in which the reproduction is to take place is too rich in minerals, too hard, or the pH value is too low or too high, the eggs will usually die. Between the egg membrane and the yolk sac, with its embryonic blastoderm and blastodisc, there is a thin, hollow cavity. Water seeps through the embryonic sac and fills this space after the egg has been laid. This way, the contents of the egg can detach itself from the embryonic sac and move freely. In this process, an equalization of a difference in density between the aquarium water and the contents of the embryonic sac occurs also called osmosis. If the surrounding water is too rich in minerals, the egg will shrink because water is being withdrawn from it. On the other hand, when the aquarium water contains too few minerals, the eggs will swell up and burst. Strictly speaking, the size of the tank is only of secondary importance. However, it should not be too small according to the size of the fish. Light should be kept somewhat subdued rather than too bright. Usually, substrate is not used so that waste is easier to remove and the number of microbes can be kept at a low level. 
Decorational pieces, such as preserved roots that hang into the aquarium from above, need not be absent. These pieces, in addition to back and side glass panels in colors that are not too dark, give the discus a feeling of safety. For breeding, the temperature of the water should be approximately 30 degrees Celsius. It's also important the area around the aquarium be kept quiet. Unusual sudden movements are completely out of place at this time and should be avoided. And now to the breeding pair itself. You can tell by observation which fish harmonize with each other or leave the fish to choose their own mates. If there's only a single pair, rather than several males and females to choose from, the only thing to do is wait and hope. Despite optimal conditions, it may turn into a long trial of your patience, especially when dealing with fish caught in the wild. But what can be done in addition to this? We asked the experienced discus breeder Manfred Goebel, is it possible to force the discus to spawn? I think, yeah. I think so, yes. I think that there are two different ways to do it. It happens again and again in nature in exactly the same way. First of all, by means of the food. A change in food, especially when the fish are fed live food, such as black mosquito larvae, or other live food, such as white worms. So by changing the food, and secondly, a change in the water. Und zum anderen eine Veränderung des Wassers. Genau wie es in der Natur auch passiert. Just as it happens in nature. Through the rainy season and through the dry season. Water changes cause the fish to spawn. The changes in the water do not have to be drastic. This can be achieved in the aquarium quite well with a normal water change using a good quality water. Normalen Wasserwechsel mit einem qualitativ guten Wasser erreichen. Man kann beim Diskus durchaus nachhelfen, indem man. The discus can be assisted by installing a peat filtration. With these few changes, we have done all the things that will encourage the fish to spawn. Was die Fische dazu bringt, zu leichen. Und das zeigt sich dann ganz schön. In ihrem Verhalten. And that becomes very clearly visible in their behavior. They will begin to swim in each other's direction, begin to look for their mate. They will begin to signal that they are ready to spawn with shaking and quivering movements. They will begin to look for an appropriate spawning substratum and begin cleaning the substratum. This activity is constantly interrupted by swimming in the partner's direction and palpitating. At this point, it can be observed that the caudal fins of the fish will become dark. And when the fish display the behavior natural to their species, they will also have light colored or yellow throats during the entire period of spawning preparation. All this can be triggered by making changes in the food or by making changes in the water or, optimally, by making changes in both factors. Discus fish belong to the group of guarding cichlids who deposit their spawn on a firm substratum. They prefer strongly slanted or vertical surfaces for this. Aside from sturdy leaves, a variety of shapes of objects are gladly and readily accepted as a spawning substratum. For example, clay pots turned upside down with predominantly slanted surfaces. Even baked bricks with only vertical surfaces are used and accepted. Sometimes the rough clay surface becomes covered with algae because there's too much light and is difficult to clean. Therefore, a plastic tube with a sufficient diameter and a fine surface structure can be placed in an upright position for use as a spawning substratum. Sometimes the discus will also spawn on the vertical side panels of the tank, but very rarely on the horizontal bottom pane.
So much for the preparations for successful breeding. Are there other factors that have to be taken into consideration? We asked successful discus breeder Jürgen Luckner. Ich möchte noch einige Anmerkungen zur Zucht bzw. deren Vorbereitung machen. I would like to make a few comments about breeding or rather about the preparations. I am an advocate of good healthy aquarium water. This means water that is biologically intact. If this kind of water is not available and you are dependent on partially desalinated osmosis or spring or tap water, it should only be used after being run through a well-functioning filter for a while and being enriched with minerals and trace elements. Before the breeding fish, or rather the breeding pairs placed in the aquarium, prepared for them make sure the animals are free of parasites. If this isn't the case, they should be treated with the appropriate medication. If this doesn't take place and the parent fish do have parasites, such as gillworms, these can be passed on to the fry and result in the loss of part of or even the entire spawn. The laying of the eggs usually occurs at midday or in the late afternoon on a firm substratum the parent fish have previously cleaned with their mouths. Apparently the parent fish determine when the embryos will hatch based on water temperature. The developmental period of up till the time of hatching is between 55 and 65 hours, depending on water temperature and water values. This means the embryos of the eggs fertilized at midday and in higher water temperatures will hatch on the evening of the second day before nightfall. When fertilization has taken place in the late afternoon and by lower water temperatures, they'll hatch after nightfall, on the morning of the third day. Hatching at night in the dark would be lethal for the larvae, at least in the wild, because the parents would not be able to gather them. Adult discus fish usually lay a large number of eggs, often as many as 200. The eggs are approximately 1.4 millimeters in length, and have a diameter of nearly 1.2 millimeters. Just as in the case of the terrestrial globe, an egg has two opposite poles and an equator. At the upper pole, we find the opening of the egg membrane, a funnel-shaped invagination of the egg membrane that is important for fertilization. Through it, the egg is fertilized by the spermatozoan. Like many other cichlid eggs, the eggs of the discus adhere to the substratum in a longitudinal position. A very thin layer of mucus forms along the egg equator, firmly adhering the egg to the surface under it. Reproduction is started with the laying of the eggs. The female swims from the bottom to the top, just above the surface of the substratum, and successfully lays the eggs. They are fertilized immediately by the male, who also swims just over the surface of the eggs, from the bottom to the top. During this process, there should be no strong water movement in the aquarium. For example, an inflow back into the aquarium from the filtering unit. The female lays the eggs from the bottom to the top, almost only in one direction, so that the opening of the egg membrane is pointing upward. Normally, the male fertilizes the spawn after each egg is laid. To fertilize the egg, the sperm must try to reach the funneled opening of the egg membrane located on the upper pole of the egg. Because the spermatozoan can usually only survive for about 30 seconds, they must reach the egg within this short time. Strong water movement would make this uncertain Reproduction first begins with the entrance of the spermatozoan into the egg cell. On average, spawning takes 70 minutes. Afterwards, the parent fish begin caring for the eggs. They stay near the nest, and usually taking turns, they direct a constant, weak flow of water toward the eggs with their pectoral fins. Firstly, this provides a good supply of oxygen-rich water, 
And secondly, it prevents dirt particles and microorganisms from collecting on the nest and harming it. The parent fish observe their nest very attentively. During this time, and in the days that follow, a faint night lighting above the nest is highly recommended for a better orientation for the parent fish. After successful fertilization, the embryonic blastoderm, which lies under the opening of the egg membrane, begins to develop, and cell division begins. In an advanced stage, this is called the cleavage of the ovum. In the polycellular stage, the blastodisc lifts itself up from the yolk and remains connected to it only on the edges. The resulting space underneath is called the cleavage cavity. Until this time, the blastodisc is still completely smooth. By looking at it, you can only guess where the head or the tail of the embryo will develop. The healthy yolk, marbled with fat particles, is clearly visible. The required oxygen is absorbed from the surrounding water by way of the embryonic sac. While the blastodermic layer develops inside, the development of the embryonic tissue, which slowly grows over the yolk from the front upper portion, is clearly visible through the embryonic sac. All of these processes are perceived by the parent fish caring for their eggs as changes. In these few hours, nature is in quite a hurry. 26 hours after fertilization, it's apparent if the environment of the eggs, that is the water temperature and so on, will allow for the development of new and healthy life. If this is not the case, many of the fertilized eggs will die off. Their yolks will curdle, and the accumulation of cells, or rather the blastodisc, will dissolve. Their life is over, after having barely begun. At this time, a healthy, normally developing egg will show very distinct changes. Approximately 40 hours after fertilization, the first fragile signs of life become visible embryonic fluid is pumped through the developing body. The first signs of the developing embryo begin to appear with the swelling of the head and the embryonic spine, which will later become the tail. The contents of the embryonic sac will become noticeably darker. The parent fish now watch the development of the eggs very attentively. Sometimes they try to remove dead eggs from the nest. Unfortunately, by doing this, healthy eggs are often destroyed as well. Approximately 50 hours after fertilization, a very critical phase in the discus's care of the eggs begins. In the following five to 10 hours, up until the time of hatching, the eggs are often eaten by the parent fish for a variety of reasons. At this time, the advancing development of the embryo is clearly visible through the embryonic sac. The swelling of the head, the embryonic spine, and the yolk are already visible. The still unpigmented eye sockets are also visible. Between the head and the yolk, the small beating heart is already clearly visible. The embryonic germ layer has now fully covered the yolk, and because of this also allows for the development of the body cavity. After approximately 55 hours, the embryo starts to become active in the embryonic sac, and the first timid body movements are clearly visible. All of these movements signal developing life to the parent fish caring for the eggs. The absence of these signals indicates development has failed to occur. This shows an increasing number of eggs quickly becoming infected with fungus. In this case, the parents will eat the spawn at once. These are processes that usually remain hidden. To help the spawn survive this critical phase in their development without risk, Asian breeders protect the spawn with wire mesh. This prevents the parent fish from eating the spawn, but allows them to care for the eggs nevertheless. 
Usually only a few hours later, the wiggling larvae will not be eaten by the parents who will continue to care for them. After about 60 hours, existence in the embryonic sac will become too cramped for the embryo. Its vigorous movements inside the embryonic sac can be seen in ever-decreasing intervals. With this movement, it manages to turn itself around inside the embryonic sac with spirited flaps of its tail. This tail flapping quickly lacerates the embryonic sac and results in direct contact with its new environment, the water. But the exertion is not over. After the developmental period of approximately 50 to 60 hours and the breaking of the embryonic sac, it takes another one to two hours to kick the torn sac over its body and head and free itself from it to finally make the transition from an embryo to a discus larva. But an important contrivance of nature keeps the embryonic sac attached to the larva for a while longer. The adhesive glands on the head of the larva, which begin to function at this time and will later keep it attached to the substratum, holding the remaining embryonic sac in place with its adhesive substance. This exhausting fight into life is shortened by the parent fish who watch these developments carefully, collect the larvae out of the embryonic sac, take them into their mouths, and then hang them onto the substratum by their adhesive mucus for further development, unfettered by all remnants of the embryonic sac. According to Professor Dr. Heinz Bremer, this first contact with the mucus of the parent fish has a disinfecting, bacteria-reducing effect. This step ends another phase of development. The growth of the larvae now continues to progress, depending on the quality of the water. After another 12 hours, the crypt for the eyes will darken, and the formation of the eyes can be observed. The head and anal areas, as well as the embryonic tail, shows signs of continuing development. The cardiac utricle, located directly under the head, pumps blood through the entire small larval body with all of its might. Even at this point in time, the larvae could die off if water conditions are bad. Eggs that have already died and have not been removed by the parent fish will now begin to slowly disintegrate. Protozoan hasten this process. Sometimes the embryonic sac will also break open and dead yolk will run out. The empty egg membrane remains, but later it will also be decomposed by bacteria and protozoan. Also at this time, the fungus infection of the dead eggs is clearly visible. The healthy larvae continue to develop. About four days after fertilization, the development of the eyes can be clearly seen. The outlines of the gills and the mouth are also visible. The small heart pumps the blood unremittingly through the body. The forming anal opening as well as the tail of the discus fish larvae are also easily recognizable now. The blood vessels on the still visible yolk can clearly be seen. Parent fish will often move the larvae. Also, the small discus are constantly becoming more active. Because of this activity, the adhesive mucus, which is produced by the larvae, is often put to the test. Six glands produce this mucus. It's mainly secreted from the upper glands in the form of mycelium and holds the larvae in place on the substratum. They hang on the substratum singly or in groups. With intensive wiggling, they create the water movement necessary for their oxygen supply. Approximately five days after fertilization, and at a water temperature of 25 to 30 degrees Celsius, the development of the larvae is already amazingly advanced. The iris of the eyes is already starting to show pigmentation. The head and parts of the body are starting to show more and more dark patches and lines. 
The mouth and the gills stand out clearly and their movement can be seen. The heart is beating strongly now. The embryonic spine, otherwise called the vertebral column, and the tail shows marked signs of the back and lower borders of the fins. However, the dorsal fin is not yet formed. At this stage of their development, the larvae can hardly hold themselves onto the substratum due to their increasingly vigorous movements. But even at this point in time, a badly stabilized water environment can result in deformities or the death of the larvae. For example, deformities of the abdominal cavity, the heart, and the vertebral column. Usually deformed larvae will be eaten by the parent fish or will perish at the bottom of the aquarium. The development of the larvae is usually completed after about six days. The head and the eyes, the mouth and the gills are completely developed and fully functional. The yolk is used up. Now the larva is nearly five millimeters long. The front glands cease to function and atrophy in the next few days. With this step, the passive larval stage comes to an end and the spawn begins to swim. It can take a period of several hours until all of the offspring are able to swim. The swimming larvae will now need their first food. This is offered to them in the form of the epidermis, the upper skin layer of the parent fish, which has heavily thickened. It is their only possible food source in these first few days of life. Its existence is apparently a crucial requirement for the further development of the larvae. Usually this is referred to as the mucus that the parent fish produce on their epidermis, or rather on the upper layer of their skin. This so-called mucus is then eaten by the larvae. But is it correct to refer to this substance as mucus? And what does this important food consist of? We asked Professor Dr. Heinz Bremer. The feeding of offspring after their birth with substances of the parent animals is an incredible evolutional development in the animal kingdom. It gives the animals more freedom because they are independent of the food supply in the environment they are born into. This perfect solution, like the one reached by mammals, naturally had its precursors. I would say they are the experiments of nature on the way to becoming mammals. With mammals, it is all very perfect. There are epithelium, or rather skin cells, that have transformed themselves into glandular cells that are shifted toward the inside and produce the milk by way of apocrine secretion, which means by way of the cells. Let's assume that this is the nucleus and here is where the milk is produced and it is stored in the uppermost part of the cell. And this entire part of the cell cuts itself off and is severed and the milk is ultimately composed of millions of such cells and the apocrine content. One of the precursors to the actual mammal milk is the milk of the pigeon. In this case, the cement substance between the cells is merely dissolved and that with which the young animals are fed in the first few days is a suspension of cells. So it is not a secretion like real milk but rather the entire cell material in suspension. 
With a discus, the entire upper layer is provided for the young fish as postnatal food, without the cells detaching themselves in any special way. This upper portion, or the epidermis, is enriched with nutrient cells with glandular cells. On this occasion, I would particularly like to point out that it is not mucus that the parent fish secrete or discharge and provide for the young fish, but rather the entire upper layer of the epidermis enriched with nutrient cells. This upper layer of the epidermis that I have just described contains only carbohydrates, fat and protein in small concentrations and in a balanced mixture. It is optimally suited for the digestive system of the still unstable young fish. In addition, the trophically functioning epidermis, the epidermis able to provide nourishment, contains immunologically effective components. This means that it strengthens the immune system of the young fish. And finally, I would like to point out that bacteria and algae can be found in the intestines of the larvae that were previously located on the epidermis of the parent fish and are ingested while grazing the epidermis. Therefore, the basis for exogenous feeding for the larvae is provided. This immediately follows the phase of being fed via the parent fish. To sum it up, I'll say once again that the discus parents provide their larvae with an intragenous substance containing carbohydrates, fat and protein in small concentrations. And secondly, this substance supports the immune system of the young fish. And thirdly, through the grazing of epibiontic bacteria and algae, the basis for exogenous feeding is established. Another important step in the process of reproduction has been mastered with the first food made available by the parents. There are often difficulties with finding the food. This means the larvae do not swim to the parent fish and starve in some corner of the aquarium. Exactly what triggers the swimming to the parents is still not fully clear. But the dark color of the parent fish appears to be important. It's apparently an important requirement for recognizing the parents. Often the larvae will mistakenly swim to dark colored aquarium utensils such as filter cartridges or the black glued edges of the aquarium. But once the first contact is made with the parent fish, for example, when the stray larvae are collected in the parent's mouth, the little ones usually remain at the side of the parents. According to popular opinion, the offspring apparently do not accept any other food in the first few days, although paramecium and other microorganisms are the right size to be food for the swimming larvae. On the other hand, the freshly hatched noplia of the Artemia salina are probably still too large to be food for them. Sometimes in well run in aquariums with natural light, as early as the second day, the swimming larvae can be observed grazing on the algae covered spawning substratum. It appears that microorganisms are the actual food. Starting a supplementary feeding with small freshly hatched noplia obviously has a very positive effect on their growth. But even when they're exclusively fed by way of the parent fish, the growth of the larvae can be observed. 
Above all, optimal water quality is important. Smaller amounts of fresh water can usually be added now without difficulty. When should supplementary feeding be started and how long must the young fish remain with their parents? On the first day after the larvae swim free, we feed them freshly hatched noblia of Artemia salina as a first supplement to the secretion available from the parent fish. Unlike some of the other discus breeders, I don't think the young fish should be separated from their parents prematurely, so that possible parasites are not contracted by the young ones. I have noticed that because the secretion is available day and night to the young fish as food, the growth of these young fish is much more constant than when they are separated from their parents after six or eight days. On the eighth day, we begin giving the young fish bosmina or other tiny water fleas as a supplementary food. This is expanded to include a food paste comprised of beef heart, beef liver, raw fish and vitamins 12 to 14 days after the larvae swim free. At the same time, we match the water values, mind you, the breeding water values, to the values of the tap water, which in my area lies between 7 and 7.5, which is considered neutral to slightly alkaline. The conductivity of the water is approximately 300 microsiemens. With plenty of food and good water quality, the young fish grow very quickly. Within a short time, their total length will double. When possible, they should be fed five to six times a day at appropriate intervals. It's important to thoroughly remove waste and food residues and to refill the tank with the appropriate amount of fresh water. Very soon, the appearance of the young fish changes. The form of their bodies changes. Often as early as the 12th day, they look like typical high-bodied mini discus fish. In this period, they begin to gather their food from the bottom of the tank as well. With this step, they gain a certain degree of independence. Even though the young fish will still swim to the parents when they're hungry or for protection, this bond becomes less strong every day. When the young fish are 15 to 18 days old, they can be separated from the parents. By this time, caring for them is no longer a problem. In the meantime, they've nearly developed into omnivores. It's only important the food pieces are not too large because discus fish have small mouths and are sometimes somewhat clumsy when it comes to eating. At this time, they should still be fed at least five to six times a day. It's also important that they receive a varied diet. Live food should be cut into appropriately small pieces when necessary. Frozen food should only be fed after being defrosted and thoroughly rinsed. Food residues and feces should be removed from the tank before each feeding. After this, a partial water change should be made when possible at least 5 to 10 percent of the tank water volume. The supplementary filter promotes the stability of the fresh water and helps to quickly reduce developing pollutants. Mistakes and acts of neglect during the first few days and weeks can seldom be made up for later. Bad water quality as well as an unbalanced diet and parsimonious feeding will soon show its effects. For example, the unattractive longish body forms are not only the degenerational effects of inbreeding, but also can be attributed to an unbalanced diet and bad water. Healthy discus fish that have been optimally raised can reach a total length of five to six centimeters at the age of two months. Although not all species and breeding varieties grow at an identical rate, this size can still be used as an average value. Breeding the discus is often a challenge. For optimal breeding of the discus, it's important to remember water care and a healthy, diversified diet. And it cannot be said too often, 
successful, healthy reproduction will only succeed in optimal water. An aquarium is only a mini biotope when compared to nature. Constantly developing wastes, such as food residues, feces, and urine, must be reduced with attentive care. This task is performed by microorganisms and certain useful bacteria, which quickly convert the toxic byproduct nitrite into the comparatively harmless nitrate through the so-called nitrification process. These bacteria are present in every aquarium. They colonize every surface. The more surface available, for example, in a large filter, the more nitrifying bacteria at your disposal as important helpers in the fight to reduce waste. For this process, the oxygen content of the water is also important. The more oxygen there is, the faster and more effective the nitrification. With too little oxygen, the less harmful nitrate may possibly be transformed into the toxic nitrite. Too much nitrate can be growth retarding. The only alternative to removing existing nitrate is regular partial water changes. This means, depending on the water volume of the tank, approximately 5 to 10 percent of the water volume before each feeding. At the same time, it's necessary to remove the feces and food residues and other waste products. With this form of water care, water low in microbes is created at the same time. This is an important requirement for successful breeding. Discus fish have special needs. Their constitution and their biological makeup make them something special in nature as well as in the aquarium. They still are and will remain a challenge for every fish keeper and breeder. The epidermis, that is the upper skin of the teleostein, is equipped with an entire collection of defense mechanisms of a structural and biochemical nature against a diversity of environmental noxa, such as parasites, saprobiotic bacteria, this means decay-loving bacteria and toxic water contents. Before the functional change to the care for the offspring can take place in the epidermis, its protecting function must be discarded and the habitat must allow for the step. Due to their nature, blackwater regions are areas low in bacteria because of the large amounts of humic acid, 101 to 103 bacteria is generally the amount that is present there. I have found aquariums with a germ count of 108 per milliliter. So problem number one with discus breeding is water with a small quantity of germs. Problem number two is the reduction of psychosomatical strain. This means avoiding stress situations. Stress reduces the efficiency of the postnatal food. It is common knowledge that cows give much less milk when they are under stress. Keeping the fish in an environment free of fear and shock and attentiveness to their well-being are further important requirements for successful discus breeding. This shouldn't be underestimated. It's reflected in the color and behavior of the fish. Discus eat in the bottom regions of a body of water. When doing this, they take in sediment particles and creatures that develop in the bottom regions, like insect larvae and so on. As a result of this behavior, their digestive tract is constantly being recolonized with bacteria. 
These sedimentary bacteria make functioning digestion possible, and therefore, successful discus breeding is a balancing act between the needs of the epidermis and the demands of the digestive tract. The success of breeding essentially depends on how one manages this compromise. Davon hängt der Erfolg der Zucht zumindest im Wesentlichen ab.